There is a problem in this world that every one of us has to face. And for most of us, we try to avoid it. That is a problem of evil that exists within us and around us and seems to come against us whether or not we know it. We have a problem of all sorts of lies in this world. Lies that we tell ourselves, lies that others tell us, lies that we believe, and we may not even know they're lies, but we think they're true. As we, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, practice his way of living, we grow near to the truth. Jesus himself said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. In Christ we find not lies, but what is true and what is good, and what is good for you and for me. But as we do so, we have to recognize that our life as Christians is complicated. You see, here in the South especially, but mostly all across this country, we teach that when you follow Jesus, life will go well for you. And we don't always say that directly. Sometimes it's really indirect. Like when somebody asks you, how are you doing? And your response is, I'm blessed. And by that, what you mean is, I don't have any problems right now. As if God's blessings only come when we don't have pain or problems. But the truth of Scripture is that to follow Christ, it's not always easy and pleasant, and it's certainly not without problems. To follow after Christ often includes walking through all sorts of trouble and hardship, but walking through it different than the world who is blinded to the truth. In order for you and I to see Jesus for who he is and to follow after him fully, we need to see evil for what it is and understand it. And to do so, today we're going to begin by talking about one of three ways in which evil comes against us. Something that many of us here in the West probably laugh at or ignore altogether. Let's just be honest for a moment. How many of you this morning have thought about the devil? A couple of you. How many of you this morning have thought about the devil and pictured in your head some kind of a little red cartoon sitting on my shoulder whispering to me all the things I should or should not do? Versus a little angel on the other side whispering all the things I should and should not do. Often in our culture when we think of the devil, if we think of the devil at all, what we picture is cartoonish at best. Maybe we have a picture of the devil and it's something really terrifying and horrible and we think that the devil exists in hell for the purpose of coming against us and torturing us and making us miserable. See, we in the West have a weird view of the devil. If we believe he exists, we often diminish who he is or change what he does. But most of the time, we don't even believe he exists. Last week, we read how Jesus sent his disciples out and told them to go and heal every disease and cast out demons. But how many of you in your daily life believe that the Lord has sent you to cast out demons? Anybody tried it this week? See, even that, when we picture exorcism or casting out demons, what comes to mind is Hollywood and heads spinning around and all kinds of people floating in the air, and we have no idea, and that sounds terrifying. So we're like, let's not talk about it or deal with it. But if you wish to follow Christ, I have a little warning for you. You need to know that following after Jesus will make you a target of an enemy. And to understand what this means, it's important to know who is this enemy and how do we stand against him? How does Jesus invite us into a place of peace and not fear? See, I know a lot of people who've spent a lot of time thinking about demons and the ones who usually think about them the most are either terrified of them or they make all kinds of really bizarre claims about demons. In college, I had a friend, we were experiencing some spiritual warfare together, a group of us, and we began to pray, and as she began to study scripture, she began to see that demons are everywhere in her world, and one day, she sent me a text, and she said, is there a demon of tripping, because I keep tripping everywhere I go, to which I replied, no, you're just really clumsy. Like Sometimes we can make every problem we have demonic. My car broke down. It must be a demon trying to stop me. No, it's probably because you needed some maintenance and neglected it for a long time, speaking from personal experience. It's not that demons and the devil are here to just like 
cause all kinds of turmoil. But they are in some ways here to cause all kinds of turmoil. In 1 Peter, it says this about the devil. It says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. There is an enemy that desires to destroy you. And the more you follow Jesus, the more you make for a delicious meal. Why? Perhaps you've heard it said, the greater you are, the harder the fall. It's easy if you're hunting and you kill a duck to leave the dead duck alone and go after the wounded one because the wounded one might get away. You can always come back for the dead one later. We have an enemy who is out to devour and to destroy. It says that he seeks to kill, steal, and destroy. His goal is your death. Not just physically. Emotionally and spiritually, his goal is that you would in every way miss out on the life that Jesus offers. And he doesn't do it by causing your car to break down or causing you to trip when you're clumsy. He does it in a much more subtle way. Throughout scripture, the the name the devil comes from a Greek word diablos, which always includes the It's never a devil, it's never broad, it's the specific devil. We get names like Satan and Lucifer and some of these other names from that term and others in Scripture used to describe who the devil is and what he does. The devil, first and foremost, what you need to know, is not the counter-opposite of God. When it comes to engaging in the lies we believe, you need to know that the devil was not a co-equal with God, but was created by God as good and perfect. One who was there to serve as a messenger, an angel, to proclaim the good news for all of creation. And somewhere along the line, between creation and the fall of man, so between Genesis 1 and 2 and Genesis 3, someplace in between there, I don't actually know when exactly, the devil, a created good being, rebelled against the Lord. And in his rebellion desired to be like God himself, to take God's place and reign and rule, to decide for himself what was good or bad, right or wrong. And if you've read in Scripture in Genesis 3, that same being created for good and corrupt by his rebellion comes to Adam and Eve and begins to speak to them. And if you read the story, that same devil speaks not truth, but lies. It says, did God really say Surely you won't actually die. Doesn't this fruit look good? You'll be like God. Though Adam and Eve were already made in God's image in every way. When we're talking about the devil and the lies that come against us in this world, we have to begin by recognizing the devil was created good and fell, and the primary way in which the devil seeks to devour, to steal, and to kill is by convincing you and me of subtle things that are not at all true. See, if the devil came to you today and whispered in your mind that elephants are all pink and can fly, how many of you would believe that elephants are all pink and can fly? Hopefully not. If you do, let's come talk, okay? See, a very obvious lie you and I recognize. I can see an elephant and it's clearly not pink, and I know they don't fly, they have no mechanism, and they weigh too much. They're definitely not birds. You and I can identify obvious lies pretty quickly. But it's the subtle lies that sneak into our mind and our heart and our lives. Subtle lies are things that sound true and are rooted in mostly true things, but not all the way. Subtle lies are things that we believe that are contrary to what God speaks See, one way to think about truth is to think about reality as it is. What is real, that is truth. And anything not real or partially real but not fully real is a lie. So when you think of things like, I am not worthy of God's love, that's 
partially true. Because by your own sin, you are not. But it's not fully reality. Because by his grace, you are made worthy in Christ. When you think things like looking in the mirror and you see yourself and say, I am a failure, that may be partially true because you have failed. But your identity is not made up of your, the sum of your mistakes, but the gift of God for you. You are a child of God and nothing can separate you from that. When the devil comes against us, his goal to steal, kill, and destroy, to devour, is to convince us of a partial truth, but partial lie. Because every partial lie, every partial removal from what is true and what is real leads us further and further away from God. And the devil does not exist in hell. In fact, if you read in Matthew 24, hell was created as a place for the devil to go. It was created as a place where he will be forever punished for the way in which he destroys and kills what God has made alive. Hell was not made for you and for me, but is a result of the death that we buy into, the lies that we believe. So to look at these lies of Satan, we're going to begin today as we look at who he is and what he does with how you and I can stand against it. Because the truth is, you are going to be under attack. Now, let me just be really clear. I believe wholeheartedly that the best Christian approach to life is nonviolence. I believe wholeheartedly that there's a whole lot of room for some to take up arms to protect and and defend. But most of the time, you and I are called to lay our lives down. And so when I talk about war, I am not telling you that you should go out and pick a physical fight. In fact, as you read in the text today, you and I have a fight much greater to fight than just one with fists and knives and guns. See, we are in a war against an enemy who knows that he's been defeated and who rages like a lion seeking to devour If you would like to open up to Ephesians chapter 6, in the Blue Bibles, this is page 1,221. If you're using your own Bible or your phone, I don't know what page that's on, but Ephesians chapter 6. This devil, this created good being who has fallen away from God, who seeks to deceive and convince us of partial truths and mostly lies, this one who is not good, how do we stand against him? Beginning in verse 10, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. I think part of why so many Christians in the West struggle in their faith is because we forget that we're actually struggling that there is an enemy who wants you to fail. And he says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. You will not engage in spiritual warfare against an enemy who hates you on your own power. You will always fail. You and I cannot engage against this enemy because he is simply stronger. He has had more time to perfect his lies that remind you of your shame and your guilt and your condemnation that tell you you will never be enough. These lies that tell you the world is all against you, that nobody could care for you, that it'd be better to stay home and live stream than to be in community together. These subtle things you cannot withstand on your own. So put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. It is tempting to believe that our struggle in this world will be fixed with the right political leader. It's tempted to believe that our struggle in this world will get better if only our spouse gets better. It's tempting to believe that the struggles we're facing will improve if only we change our job or our living situation or our present reality, but our struggles are not against flesh and blood. 
It's not against the people who say things you disagree with or find wildly offensive or overtly untrue. It's not against the people who maybe have wronged you and sinned against you. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against all kinds of powers and principalities that seek to steal, kill, and destroy. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Paul, as he's writing to the church in Ephesus, he spent this whole letter writing about how they worship rightly, how they become the community that submits to the Lord wholly, how they live out their faith. And he says, finally, that you may withstand the enemy, take up this armor of God. And he uses Roman armor to describe how you and I should stand against the enemy. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going into all the specifics of how Roman armor worked. All of this is mostly reminding us not to literally put on a belt called truth or a breastplate of righteousness. Though if you wanted to wear a big like metal breastplate like old knights do, that'd be pretty awesome. I welcome it, but not in this heat, all right? He's not telling us this is literally what we do. He's saying, look, like these things, how they protect you. This is how you are guarded against the devil. Take up the belt of truth. Let everything be held together by what is true. Put on a breastplate of righteousness. Guard your heart by righteousness. Not your own self-righteousness, but Christ's given to you. You are made whole and holy by Him. When schemes of the enemy come against you to tell you otherwise, that you're not yet enough, that you are too broken or too far gone, guard your heart with this truth. He has made you his. Continues and gives all kinds of things like the shield of faith. This is the one thing with the Roman uh, armor that I find really fascinating. See, their shields were made so that they could be put together side by side in a group if ever needed. And the ones on the outside of the group would have their shields on the outsides And the ones in the middle would have their shields overhead. And together they would form almost a moving unit that would protect from any direction and any angle. See, the truth is Roman soldiers were not very good in battle by themselves, but were great together as a unit. You on your own seeking to fight against the lies of the enemy will will at some point falter and fail. But we together, the shield of faith, the community of people who stand firm and believe what is true, we will be able to defend against all kinds of flaming arrows that come against you. He goes on, the helmet of salvation. I don't know about you, but I am often prone to waking up in the middle of the night with all kinds of thoughts that are not filled with the peace and the joy and the life of Christ. Just a couple of days ago, as an example, before bed, I went to bed and I felt really distant from my wife, though we had done nothing that would cause us to be distant. And I woke up in the middle of the night several times angry with her for the things she had not done against me at all, making up all kinds of lies in my mind that I know were not true, but they were there. Take up the helmet of salvation, guard your mind with what is true, that you have been saved. Salvation comes from a Greek word that implies salve, like a healing ointment that you have been no longer broken, but made whole, and God is bringing you healing. 
So I woke up in the morning angry with my wife for things she did not do based on thoughts that were not true. And I had to recognize that's not who she is or who we are as a couple. And I even had to go to her and apologize and say, I've been angry with you for something you didn't do, for a lie that I've allowed myself these last 12 hours to hold on to and believe, knowing that it's not true. Will you please forgive me? When your mind is filled with things that are not true, remember this healing Jesus brings, the salvation you have. It says, praying at all times in the Spirit. We take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. If you and I wish to stand against all lies of the enemy, we have to begin by recognizing God's Word is true. And not because it's some really good words on a a piece of paper that we can read, but because this word always points us to Jesus. And I love that the sword we're to take up is the word of God because when it comes to lies that come against us, it's tempting to believe we need to be the one who fights back to defend ourselves and to prove others wrong, to speak what is true in the face of all sorts of untruth. But if the word of God is Jesus, as John 1 says, if the word of God is Christ himself, we do not need to defend ourselves, but to turn to Jesus and let him do what he already promised to do, to guard and protect. See, Jesus told his disciples that he was going to send them out like sheep among wolves, and he warned them that there would be division and all kinds of hardship, that the kingdom of heaven would violently be advancing, not because it was advancing with violence, but because it was advancing forcefully against a world that pushed back against it. And yet Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. If we look at 1 John, it says this in 1 John, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. For you and me, as we stand in truth, as we push back against those lies that whisper in our brains day in and day out, those things we hold to be true that are not We need to hold to this. It is the work of God to come and destroy the devil. The reason Jesus came was not just for our sins. See, we often like to emphasize Christ uh, coming as a substitute for us. Because I sinned, he took my place. But there's another truth that for the last 2,000 years the church has celebrated. Christ victorious. Because he died and rose again. We have victory. He has come to set us free from an enemy who's enslaved us, from lies that have left us broken and hurting, to set us free so that we now have life and life abundant. Today, we often don't think about the devil, and when we do, we minimize him or we overplay his role. But throughout Scripture, his role is always to deceive us, to believe what is not true. And up until just the last couple hundred years, most of Christianity has believed that he's real and that he's active. Even today, if you go to developing nations or nations that are outside of the Western train of thought, it's very common to have exorcisms every time you gather because Satan is always coming against us, so we should always push back and say, not today, Satan. And if you've ever heard of a guy named Martin Luther, he was a pastor and theologian in the 1500s, he gives some really solid advice for how you and I can stand against the devil. You ready for this? Here, here goes. So when the devil throws your sins in your face and declares that you deserve death and hell, Tell him this, I admit that I deserve death and hell. What of it? For I know one who suffered and made satisfaction on my behalf. He or his name is Jesus Christ, son of God. And where he is, there I shall be also. See, we don't need to hide from the accusations of the devil when he reminds you of your sin and your failure, that you are not good enough, lovable, that you are all sorts of things that are untrue. You can look him in the face and say, you were right. 
I deserve death and hell. Thank God for Jesus. For that's enough. Now, Martin Luther also had another sense of humor. I I didn't put this quote up there word for word, but I'll, I'll paraphrase. Another way in which he said we can stand against the devil is when he reminds you of all your sin, turn your back to him and tell him to kiss your backside. Because he also is fallen like you, but you are redeemed and he is not. And if that doesn't work, break wind in his face to remind him that he smells even worse than you. I love Luther. He's great. I don't know if you knew those were two options for how you can fight the devil, but there you go. See, you and I do not need to be afraid as Christians of an enemy who is seeking to devour, but we do need to be aware, aware that he is still furiously seeking to pull you and I away from what is true and good and beautiful. From the grace of God, the salvation He gives, the gifts He pours out, we are constantly being pulled away by His lies. And it's not big and scary to stand against Him because you and I in Christ have all victory. I love the analogy of World War II when thinking about our battle against the devil. See, any historian will look at World War II and look at D-Day and the invasion of Normandy as the turning point when the Allies began to win the war. It was from that point forward the war was won. But from that point forward, more soldiers died on both sides than previously. The war was won, but the battle continued to rage. And death and sorrow and destruction continued even as victory was at hand for you and I as Christians. On Christ's D-Day, when he came into this world and invaded death itself and took our place, and he suffered and died and descended into hell and rose again, then victory was won. And nothing will change that. And there's a battle raging now where more and more people are falling prey to death and destruction and the lies of the enemy. And you and I as followers of Christ are called to recognize the lies of the devil, to stand against them firm in what he has done, and to speak truth, and to be truth. To exist has a real difference in this world, demonstrating not our power but our weakness. For in our weakness, he is made strong. In our brokenness, when we're open and honest, I am by myself not enough. But he is. In that place, we can speak to a world of brokenness, a whole lot of hope and healing, a whole lot of salvation for those who need it, that Christ has come to set them free. And you and I get to be that example for them. So I want to encourage you, whatever lies you may witness or hear or begin to believe this week, hold fast to what is true. Stand firm on this foundation of Christ's strength and his life given for you to rescue you and to free you. And may you this week walk in confidence, knowing that whatever the devil throws against you, he will not prevail. For no, even death itself cannot overcome you. In this world, you will have trouble. But Christ has overcome the world. Will you pray with me? God, we know we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against all kinds of powers and principalities and authorities of evil in this world. And we know there is coming a day when you will return. And the battle will be over and you will give rest to all who follow after you. Rest from our labors and our labors against the devil. Lord, teach us to stand firm upon what is true. To recognize the powers that be that are coming against us. May we see those who are our enemy not as our enemy, 
but as enslaved servants who do not know the truth, that you love them and are for them. May we see those who disagree with us as people to be loved deeply and holy. May we be a people who stand upon what is true, who take up the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit. May your word guide us. May your truth set us free. Amen.